Welcome to Fresh Goods Down Under. I think this is episode nine. Uh, I'm going with it. Um, it's Friday morning here in Australia, and maybe Thursday evening, uh, perhaps, if you're watching this from the UK or in America, perhaps. Uh, for those people who are returning, welcome back to the show. And uh, for those of you who are new to this, uh, welcome to the show. And uh, the way this works is basically it's a live Q&A session and we are going to talk about all things to do with mountain biking. We're going to talk about some news that's been going on the website this week on singletrackworld.com. Um, I've got a bike here, a test bike, which I'm um, going to be chatting about this and a few other things. Oh, and we've got Shed Life Guy in the house. Welcome, Shed Life Guy. Thanks for tuning in. Uh, G'day, Will. In a never-ending world of new stuff, I think the new Caliber Century Pro has got to be the bargain of the year. So much bike for under £3,000. Why can't other companies do this? So Shed Life Guy is right in on the questions here. Um, just uh, for anyone who's tuning in, who if, if you've not watched before, um, welcome. And this is a live video on YouTube. It's a live Q&A session, so send me in your questions. Um, if it gets busy later on, I apologize. I might not be able to answer all the questions coming through, but uh, Shed Life Guys there is um, talking about the new Caliber Century. Now, this is a new bike that came out yesterday. Oh, sorry, no, you're in the UK, so it came out today. <laughs> For me, it was yesterday. Um, the Century is a new long travel 29er from Caliber Bikes. Now, Caliber Bikes is, uh, they've become very famous for, well, famous in the mountain bike industry for their uh, boss nut, right? So um, this is a really popular sub 1,000 pound full suspension mountain bike. They've just brought out a longer travel version, uh, but it's a 29er, it's a 29er enduro bike, 150 mil travel on the back, 160 on the front. Uh, Trail Talk MTB's in the house. Hello, Trail Talk MTB, thanks for joining. Um, who's just mentioned there that it looks like an absolute steal. Oh, Billy Bot Basher, sorry, I missed your comment there. Agree, too many companies looking for huge profit margins. So just to give you some background on Caliber Bikes, they're the in-house brand, uh, in-house brand, I should say, uh, for Go Outdoors. And of course, Go Outdoors is a huge, uh, or a large um, outdoor retail company um, in the UK with stores all over the country. Hey Will, says Trail Orchid to MTB. Hello, thanks for joining in. Um, and of course, Caliber Bikes is the in-house brand. So um, from what I understand about how it works there, I mean, you've got quite a large company with a, with a large amount of buying power. So although Caliber Bikes has kind of come out of nowhere, really five years ago, they didn't exist. So they've, they've really come out you know, they've, they've come out firing on all cylinders. So um, with some really great value bikes and uh, good accessibility around the country, compared to direct to, to consumer brands like uh, YT or Commensal or Rose, um, Canyon, those kind of brands, um, the difference with Caliber is you can go into a store and you can see it. Um, and that's a really big thing for a lot of people. Um, and perhaps Caliber is tapping into a new market there, outdoorsy people who maybe aren't going to walk into a normal bike shop, but they walk into a go outdoor shop, see a mountain bike, chat to the sales staff there. Um, maybe they're tapping into a new market there because they've been really popular. And I think if you go to any UK trail center, guaranteed you'll see that boss nut everywhere. They're very, very popular. So back to the century, really uh, cool looking long travel 29, a very progressive geometry. I know Mike Sanderson, I've met him a few times. He's a really switched on guy. And I think he has quite a bit of flexibility um, to design bikes how he wants them to ride. So although he's part of a large company, um, as far as Caliber Bikes is concerned, he's got quite a bit of free reign there to make the, you know, you can see that in the century, it's very long, it's very slack, it's very, very progressive geometry. So um, he's had the ability to spec it out how he wants and design it. And uh, I think uh, Andy's been very impressed with that. Uh, you may have seen his um, review already on the website. If you haven't, jump on singletrackworld.com to check that out. Uh, Trail Talk MTB is asking, are they planning to expand their distribution overseas? That is a really good question. I don't know the answer to that, um, but I will ask Mike that question and find out if Caliber is going to be available more widely outside the UK. Given the rave reviews they've been getting over the last couple of years, I would hazard a guess that they would be wanting to get their bikes to a broader market. So uh, we'll find that out though, I don't know for sure. Uh, John Stewart, are uh, the Go Outdoor staff clued up on the Caliber product though? I don't know, I'm not too, not too sure about that. Um, because yeah, if you've got an outdoor shop, you've got a huge amount of product to wrap your head around as a staff member. I used to work in an outdoor shop many years ago and I had to know about kayaks. Um, I had to know about waterproof jackets. Also, know, you had to know about uh, road bikes and commuter bikes and hybrid bikes, but then also had to be able to sell a tent and a sleeping bag 
um, and freeze dried food and you know cook stoves and sunglasses you know so there's there's a huge product range there so it's a really valid question so perhaps um, maybe you'll get that more specialist knowledge in a bike shop uh, maybe you will get it in a go outdoor shop I don't know I've not been into one myself so if anyone who's uh, watching at the moment who's had a positive or a negative experience um, or would like to tell us about what they found with uh, checking out caliber bikes in a shop, uh, caliber bikes in a shop, that'd be really good to uh, to know for sure. Some first-hand experience, right? So I've got um, a couple of things I want to talk about today, but please fire away any questions you've got. Shed Life guys uh, got a question here. They have a or a comment rather. They have a rider doing all the EWS rounds, so I guess they're looking to expand. Yeah, that's pretty cool, huh? So they've got the. Um, um, I think the Century Pro, which is the, the top end model, which will be raced on the EWS. So I'm sure they'll be getting lots of exposure from that. A lot of people are excited. As you said before, I mean, how, how, how aren't other brands competing at this price? It's quite an astonishing price point. They're able to bring this big, burly, long travel enduro bike. Um, so I think definitely other brands will be taking notice, that's for sure. Um, so it'd be interesting to see if uh, perhaps there's any retaliation there. We're going to see a new crop of kind of, you know, bargain basement. Well, it's still two grand. It's still a lot of money, but, um, you know, lower price kind of long travel bikes that are burly and beefy and perhaps heavy, but, you know, solid bikes that you can jump on and you don't really have to upgrade a whole lot of stuff. I think that Century Pro is a bit like that. I mean, they've got everything on there hard casing tires, they've got wide rims, they've got you know proper long travel dropper posts, good forks, good suspension, so kind of ticking a lot of boxes there. Um, right, so I'm gonna talk about a couple of things today. I've got a few bags here that I wanna talk about, and reason being is I've been sort of mixing it up a little bit with bags and backpacks at the moment. I wanted to talk about the top tube bag that I've been using on this bike, because I've had it for about a month now, and I really, really like it. I didn't think I'd like it to begin with, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk about this a little bit. This is, you may have seen this already um, on, a, uh, on a live Q&A chat. Uh, you may have seen it on um, uh, Fresh Goods Friday. We've featured this um, on the website already. This is an Australian brand. It's uh, a guy called um, uh, Keaton is his name, and his company is Bike Bag Dude. And normally you'll see Bike Bag Dude do panniers, you know, uh, bike packing style frame bags, big saddle bags, um, chaff bags, top tube bags, um, handlebar bags, that kind of thing. Um, that sort of stuff uh, for the type of riding that I do is, is not really essential. Um, but I like the look of this and I spoke to him about it. It's a mini top tube bag, so they do two sizes. This is the smaller size. Um, now I guess like you probably just call this a triathlon feed bag, like that's kind of what this is modelled on, the idea back in the day, or even still now I should say, but the idea originally was to have a little bag on your top tube, so if you're racing triathlon or you're doing time trials or whatever, you don't have to worry about reaching into your back pocket, especially if you're on a time trial position. You want to have everything accessible at the front so you can you don't have to move your position so much because those bikes will be a bit sketchy. Um, so you have a little bag on here with all your gels and your, your, your snacks and snuff and uh, probably EPO and so on. Um, but uh, there are various kind of iterations of this type of bag. This is pretty big and this is what I was initially concerned about with this bag. Um, it's their mini top tube garage and it's basically a large size bag that wraps around with a velcro strap on the stem we've got a velcro strap underneath the top tube two velcro straps I should say which keeps it secure and basically gives me access to all the stuff that I would normally run in a saddle bag now because of this long stroke dropper post if I push that down you guys might be able to see not a whole lot of clearance here so these days it's very becoming very difficult to oops becoming very difficult to run a saddle bag because the tire basically whacks it. So this is kind of the alternative. And I'm just gonna wheel the bike out of the way for the moment. I'm gonna take this bag off. So I've got two straps underneath the top tube and one around the head tube. And this is the bag. Uh, what I like about this is uh, these straps are actually not part of the bag. Um, they run through a little, uh, like a daisy chain type loop here. So if the straps get damaged, or if they wear out over time, you just pull that out and put some new Velcro through. Uh, John Stewart is saying, handy for night riding batteries and as a, as a peanut protector. <laughs> yes, absolutely. It's a, a nice soft padded uh, obstacle there to give you a little bit of cushioning between, uh, yes, your peanuts and the stem of the bike. Um, also for carrying night riding batteries. That is an excellent idea, John. I've never thought of that actually. That's a really good idea. 
because um, a lot of night lights and here in Australia, we the, the evening is getting darker, so it's coming up to night riding season. Um, a lot of those um, handlebar lights that you would normally run, you would have a battery pack that would strap on um, sometimes onto a really long stem back in the day or on the top tube, but you could put it in this bag for sure. I'll show you what I've got in here. Um, and this is basically a bag that I use to have kind of the, the basic essentials that I need for most test rides. And the beauty about this type of bag, which I really like, is that these three Velcro straps, you can just take it off the bike and bang it onto another bike. So currently I've got four test bikes on the go, and that means I don't have to worry about having tubes, you know, taped onto the frame, or I don't have to worry about having all the necessary tools in my backpack or several backpacks or whatever. It's all in here. Um, and I really like that, it's really simple. Just swap it onto the next bike and I know at least, uh, you know, psychologically, I know I've got most things to get me um, out of a pickle. So we've got one big strap here, uh, sorry, one big zip here. This is a waterproof zip, if you can tell. Um, the fabric itself has some water resistance. It's not entirely a waterproof construction, um, but hopefully it'll keep things relatively dry. Um, I carry just a little lightweight kind of flip out multi-tool. Um, I actually put this in there yesterday because I rode without a backpack completely. And, uh, and I just wanted to have um, you know, a few, few tools handy there. That's from Fabric. That's um, quite a nice little multi-tool, actually. Um, we also have, oh, essential item, pressure gauge. I'm a bit obsessive about tire pressure. Is anyone else obsessive about tire pressure? Um, do you have a gauge? And, and if you do, can you tell me what sort of gauge you've got? I'd be really interested to know. Um, I, as I said, I'm a bit obsessive about tire pressure and I get really interested about tire pressure gauges. Um, this is a Lazine digital gauge, so I'm just going to turn it on so you can kind of see uh, there it's turning on. There we go, zero PSI. Thankfully, this room is, uh, um, is not under heavy amounts of pressure. Zero PSI, so you basically just push it onto the valve um, and that digital reading there will give you your tire pressure, which is quite neat and it's reversible. So you, at the moment, it's for a Presta valve, but that gold piece there, I'll demonstrate, we can unthread this, da, 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 and there's your Schrader valve, so it will do both. Um, I don't think I've ever used it on a Schrader valve, to be honest, it's always on Presta, there's a little bleed button up here, so you can whack it on after you've pumped up with a, um, with a floor pump um, to higher pressure, and then you can use that bleed valve to drop the pressure down, you've got the uh, indicator there, so that's really useful, um, I really like those. Let's have a look what else is in the bag. Um, oh, does anyone dig these? Park Tools uh, spare patch kit. Not very sexy, to be honest, GP2s. Um, these are glueless patches, invaluable in my experience for out on the trail, because you don't have to worry about glue, um, waiting for glue to dry, and um, that's always a really sticky, messy process. These are great, you just peel the back off and you just slap it onto the tube, um, or on the inside of the tire if you need a little boot um, if you've got a slash in the tire and you kind of want to stop the tube from blowing out of the tire casing. So um, what sort of patches do you guys use? Does anyone have any particular brand or style that they prefer? I'd love to know. Um, speaking of tubeless repairs, I've got the, um, a Max Salami kit here. Now this is sort of not dissimilar from really any of the other tubeless repair kits on the market. I really want to try the Dynaplug system because I've not used that before and everyone raves about it. So we've got a little fondue fork, there we go, you can see that. And it uh, comes with a bunch of these, um, oh they're all stuck together. Um, comes with all these like little poo sticks in there and you basically get your uh, fondue fork, um, thread that over a poo stick, jab it into the hole in the tyre and when you pull the fondue, st you give it a bit of a twist first to kind of like wrap it around on the inside of the tyre pull that out and that should, in theory, plug the hole. So uh, always carry those for tubeless repairs. But I have had a couple of punctures lately which, you know, they, the slash in the tire is usually a little bit big. Um, oh, Shed Life Guy, I've been using Dynaplugs for five years, brilliant product, that's good to know. Um, yeah, I, I don't think I've ever heard any bad experience with Dynaplug, um, especially with those metal tips. So the difference being that these are just like a, a rubber, sorry, a vulcanized rubber stick. The Dynaplug uses a similar material, but the end of the uh, stick is a little metal bulb, and that is designed to go inside the tire, and when you pull out the stick, um, it holds the, the plug inside the tire. It's really clever, those Dynaplugs. So um, thank you, Shed Life Guy, for the, uh, for the knowledge there. That's good to know. Uh, CO2 canister, of course, just in case. 
and there should be, <laughs> I hope I've got everything in here. Yeah, a little Topic um, uh, CO2 threaded chuck there. Um, so I keep that for, uh, for emergencies. Uh, a couple of tire levers, of course. These are Bontrager tire levers. Um, I've used these quite a bit and they're, they're quite nice. Got a little hook on the end there for your spoke. Come as a pair, they're quite useful. Um, any tire levers really, they'll kind of do the same job. Oh, money for anyone in the UK. This is, this is plastic money. You guys are just starting to embrace this at the moment, but uh, we've been onto this for a while here in Australia. Fantastic, especially if it gets wet. Um, and it's a nice small note as well. You know, in the UK, they're like really big notes. Um, my wallet never actually fit your money. It was really annoying. Anyway, so nice little emergency cash, you know, to get a coffee or, um, or a donut or something, uh, you know, if you're bonking on a ride. Um, or that might mean something else in uh, British talk. Oh, lightweight tube. Of course, um, I like to carry a nice lightweight one just because they take up, physically take up less space. Um, so I don't know which brand this is, this probably came on a bike or something, but uh, yeah, nice lightweight inner tube. Not like a latex one or anything, a standard, um, standard rubber tube. Um, but yeah, something nice and lightweight. It doesn't take up a lot of space and uh, always have a spare tube there. And I've got this handy little uh, drug packet here, which I like to keep in lots of tiny spares. One thing I've learned to carry with me, oh, Shed Life Guy, I don't use tape in my tubeless tires either. I use Dean Easy spoke plugs and they have never let me down. Ah, so they're individual spoke plugs, aren't they? They're like a silicon rubber type thing. You kind of press them down into each um, spoke hole inside the rim and that means you don't have to use tape. So that's, that's quite a neat little solution there. Sounds like it would take a while to install. Does it, <laughs> what's the fastest installation time, Shed Life Guy? I'd love to know. Um, spare tubeless valve. That's really useful. If you damage a tubeless valve on, uh, on your wheel for whatever reason, maybe using a pump and you're getting a little bit vigorous with your pumping and you bend the valve, I've done that before, um, then it's really useful just to have a spare one of these. Um, I also have a spare valve core too. So um, it's actually threaded, there we go. So spare valve core, that's, that's good to have. Maybe these get gunked up with sealant or something happens and you're on the side of the trail swearing at your tire because there's fucking air going everywhere. Um, so a spare valve core, spare tubeless valve, and a Schrader adapter. So this little brass thing, these things are, are invaluable, super basic, but it means that you can thread this onto your Presta valve, and if your pump fails or you've run out of CO2 canisters, at least you can limp your way to a service station, a petrol station, and you can use their car um, uh, in inflation devices uh, is what I'm looking for um, with a little straighter adapter. So that's crucial. Oh, Shed Life Guy, just uh, 10 minutes, no tape lift, priceless. Yes, and tape does deteriorate over time as well. So I like the idea of those plugs. Uh, we've got spare chain links in here, of course. You've always got to be prepared. Um, not only do I have 12-speed uh, um, eagle links here, you can see that lovely oil slick um, color, that rainbow color, that's very nice. Um, I've also got 11 and 10 speed links in here as well because it's just nice to have a few extra spares, particularly if you're in a group riding scenario. Um, you know, you've, you've probably been on a group ride where someone gets a puncture, um, someone breaks a chain, someone does something stupid. And, uh, and then it infringes on your ride time because they can't fix it properly. So anyway, I carry a couple of extra chain links in there just in case uh, one of my riding buddies might have a mechanical and then you can help out and then they can buy you beer at the end of the ride. So really, you'd be stupid not to, wouldn't you? So that's, um, that's basically everything I carry inside that bag. Do you, what do you guys think of this? Um, as I said before, when I first got it, I was a bit skeptical. Um, oh, there you can see, nice orange color inside, so you can find everything. That's fantastic, so it's not black. It's actually easy to spot. Oh yeah, and I've got cable ties in here. I'm discovering all these extra things I have. Uh, there you go, there's some uh, zip ties, so they're always useful. You never know when you might need zip ties. Um, but I'd love to know what you think of this. Um, I'm really into it. It looks bulky, and that's what I was worried about, um, but it's actually, it's quite slim and the material itself, it's, it's got a good amount of density to it as well, so it holds its shape really well, even when you've got it loaded with stuff. Um, and the padding, the, the walls are kind of semi-padded and that means that it tends to hold things in well and it doesn't bounce around so much. The only issue I've had is this zip and uh, the fact that when you're mountain biking it does it does make a bit of noise when it's bouncing around. Now I spoke to Keaton about this early this week and he said, right, I've got a solution for you. Cut off that metal zip, 
and we're gonna put um, a little bit of bungee cord on there instead. So I do actually have that at home. I'm gonna make that mod this afternoon and I think that'll make this top tube bag pretty much perfect. Um, if you'd like to kind of carry all those essential items that I've just gone through there, your tube, pressure gauge, tire levers, your tubeless kit, um, spare chain links, valves, etc., etc., all your emergency spares, and just physically have it on your bike rather than on your back in a backpack or in a, or in a bum bag, in a fanny pack, um, I'm a big fan of this. So, um, so yeah, I'd love to know what you guys think of this. Um, I do have some other bags here that I'm gonna talk about. Now, if you've got any questions for me, jump in, this is a live video. For those who are tuning in, we've got lots of people tuning in at the moment. Hello everyone, and if this is the first time that you've joined us, welcome to the show. This is a live Q&A video that we're doing every Friday morning here in Australia, which is Thursday evening in the UK and in parts of America. Um, so by all means, I have a, a screen right in front of me here. Put your question in the comment section right there down the bottom, and I should be able to, well, hopefully try and answer them for you. Um, anything about mountain biking, by all means, throw it out there, doesn't matter how obscure. Um, the more obscure, the better though, because uh, that's, that's always good to have a few curveballs. Um, bum bags, what do we think of bum bags? I'd love to get people's uh, opinions on fanny packs, bum bags, waist packs, uh, a few different names that these go by. Uh, oh, we've got DP MTB in the house. Great to see another vid from you. Thanks, Dan. Hey, Dan, thanks for tuning in. Thanks for the kind words, mate. I'm glad you're enjoying the video. And uh, this is a weekly video, so we're, we're gonna be doing this live video every week, every Friday morning here in Australia. Um, this is a Camelback Repack. Now, currently, this is the best waste pack I've ever used personally. Um, the reason I say that is it's got a good mix of volume. You know, there's a reasonable amount of storage space here. I'm gonna go through what I've got stored inside here. Um, but most importantly, it's quite stable. A lot of these bum bags, when you load them up, they tend to bounce around a lot and it's really horrible, especially if you're pedaling kind of open moorland, you know, cross country type stuff, lumpy grass, lumpy ground, and you're kind of bouncing around and these things, ooh, 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 and they dig into your waist, they dig into your belly, the strap on the front here, which I find really distracting and uncomfortable. This is about as stable as they get. You still get a little bit of wobble, um, but it's fairly low profile. You'll see it doesn't stick out so much from your back. The closer you can get it to your back, the more stable um, it's going to be. Um, inside we have a reservoir. I'll show you the outside first. This is the drinking tube. I don't know if I've got any water in here. Mm. So I do, and it's delicious. It's, um, it's not horrible at all. Um, there's a little magnetic uh, button here catch here, I should say, and that basically holds the hose around your waist, which is really clever. And all you have to do is just flick that up and then you can, uh, you can drink that while you're riding. So very, very easy to do. Um, big fan of Camelback's hydration bladders and their new bite valves on the Crux Reservoir. These are really good, high volume, lots of, lots of water flow, um, the best in the business in my honest opinion. Um, the bladder itself is one and a half liters. So this is kind of like two bottles. So um, if your frame can take two bottles, fantastic. Um, a lot of frames will only take one. A lot of frames will take no bottles at all if you've got like an orange stage five, which I was testing last year. Um, so one and a half liters in here, which is very, very useful. Ollie W's in the house. Hey Will, thanks for keeping me sane. Tuning in from a boat somewhere near Barcelona. Holy moly, what are you up to over there? That, sound, that sounds very luxurious, and I don't know why you're watching uh, me talk about bike stuff in a shed. If you're off the Mediterranean somewhere near Barcelona, that sounds quite lovely. Well, thanks for tuning in, Ollie. I hope you're having a wonderful time, and uh, I hope the, the sun is shining down nicely on you there in the med. Um, so yes, this is the one and a half litre Crux Reservoir, so it's quite small. Um, I don't always fill it up all the way. I might run it sort of half full, so 700 mil, 800 mil. Um, but if you do load it up to one and a half liters, it fits in pretty neatly. I'm just gonna stow it into its sleeve. So it's got its own separate pocket at the back here. There's a, a little elastic um, uh, mesh at the top here, or uh, a band, I should say. Keeps it separate from everything else in the bag. And even if you load it up, it does stay pretty stable. Oh, Simon Johnston's in the house. Hello, Simon. Uh, when do we get the Trans 29er update? Oh, you're hanging out to hear that one. Um, I'm doing a little bit more testing um, over next week. I actually want to head up to the Victorian high country. Um, I've got a few days off work, so I'm planning to take that bike um, and a couple of others to go do some riding around Bright and hopefully Mount Buller as well. Um, basically, um, I'm really happy with that bike and I'm not far off finalizing the review, but I just wanna take it on some really long downhills and I wanna take it on some really steep 
shit as well. Um, so I'm gonna head up to the high country next week and do a bit of final testing, um, do some video stuff. So not long is the answer to the question, um, Simon. So yeah, we'll be wrapping up with that bike in the very near future, so stay tuned. Uh, we'll have a video on YouTube and also the review on singletrackworld.com as well. Um, right, so in this bag, um, I'll show you what I carry on a typical ride. Um, we've got two little emergency lights here. These are little Bontrager. I'm going to blind the bejesus out. There you go. There's the flashing rear light. These are fantastic USB rechargeable, quite compact. Um, does anyone else carry kind of emergency lights in their backpack? I think it's a really good idea because especially at the moment where it's getting a little darker in the evenings here, it's just nice to have these little guys just stowed away in your backpack in case you need them. Uh, Shed Life Guys uh, saying, I've ordered that new Evoc backpack with the, remo Whoa! With the removable uh, back protection. Being diabetic, I have to take a bit more stuff than your average rider. All oh, right, so you would be taking, sorry, let me just uh, manage this bike so it doesn't fall over. Um, right, so yeah, you've got a lot of medical stuff you need to carry with you. So understandably, a little, little bag like this might not have enough room to carry everything you need. Um, and we've got uh, Billy Bob Basher here. Any further impressions on the white from last week? Yes, um, so since we last spoke, I'd ridden that over the weekend. Um, Really enjoying that bike. Um, I am probably going to kill myself on that bike, to be perfectly honest. It's an absolute riot. Um, and the tyre combo, the Maxxis Forecaster on the front, the cross mark on the back, um, even with those tyres, um, it's actually very controllable, that bike. I really want to get some proper meaty rubber on it to see how hard it could be pushed. But I'm actually kind of keen to leave the stock tyres on there and just see how much I can get away with. Um, but yes, that's, uh, that, that, that bike is bonkers. I'm really, yeah, really digging that at the moment. Uh, DPMTB, Will, how do you compare intense sniper trail to your recent short mid travel trail bikes? That is an amazing question because I literally got an email from intense Australia yesterday, um, about the sniper trail. Um, so that's the intense sniper. They do two versions. They do the sniper cross country and the Sniper Trail. Now it's the same frame between the two, but what they do is they put a slightly longer stroke shock. The eye to eye is the same, but the stroke is longer on the trail, and that increases travel from 100 to 120 millimeters. And they balance that out by putting a longer fork on the trail. So the XC bike is 100 front and rear, and the trail is 120 front and rear. It's the same carbon fiber frame that they use between the two. Um, so yes, that's a really good question. I'm really hanging out to ride that bike. Um, I know my colleagues reviewed the Intense Sniper XC um, only uh, last year. They did that in a kind of modern geometry, you know, 29er XC bike test. Um, but I'm really keen to try out the trail, particularly because I've been testing a lot of 120 mil travel 29ers at the moment around that same travel bracket. Um, so that's, that's hilarious that you've brought that up because yes, I'm currently sussing one out to test. Very interested to try it out. I hear the suspension design is quite firm, very racy and efficient. So I'm interested to see if that translates to the trail version, whether or whether it's going to be a little bit more supple and a little bit deeper. Um, but uh, we'll find out. So yes, thank you for your question. Hopefully I'll have um, a bike, a test bike soon and some feedback for you as well. Uh, Billy Bot Basher, good to hear. Just don't hurt yourself, eh? <laughs> yeah, we're talking about the white S120. I've been getting back into Strava a little bit lately. I've been, I've, I haven't used it for about three years. And uh, since coming back to Bendigo, I've been enjoying kind of the, the banter that comes along with Strava, right? Where you write a section and then you might get a message from a mate later on going, oh yeah, you're trying to steal my com or, you know. Um, so I've been quite enjoying like rediscovering um, old trails that I used to ride a lot um, when I used to live in Bendigo, but coming back now and riding those trails again. And uh, yeah, I have, um, I must admit, I have been, um, you know, keeping an eye on the, uh, the fastest times for certain segments. And that white S120 that, um, that I did the live Q&A on last week um, has already bagged me, well, it's bagged me numerous PRs, but it bagged me a com. And uh, I don't really, I'm not a com kind of person, you know, I'm more of a mid-pack kind of rider. But the fact that I was able to put, I don't know, five seconds into the, the previous fastest time, I was very, very happy with myself. Very proud of myself, actually. Um, so, yeah, but, I, but this is the problem with Strava is you kind of end up racing yourself um, or racing the clock and perhaps uh, getting into a little bit of trouble. So hopefully I don't die while I'm riding that bike for sure. John Stewart's in the house. Quick question, any experience using specialized 2FO clip light, no cleat installed on flats? 
Is the, sole, is the sole too stiff or will it be okay? Currently on the mallet ease, wanna try flats? Really good question, John. I have tested those exact shoes um, and in answer to your question, I wouldn't recommend it. I wouldn't recommend, uh, it depends what you wanna do, but if, you, if you've got standard shoes, uh, SPD shoes, and you remove the cleat and you're using it on a flat pedal, You'll be able to ride the bike, it'll be okay, but the sole will be very stiff. It will be overly stiff. Normally the rubber and the tread won't have a lot of grip as well for your pins on a flat pedal. So look, you will be able to ride it. You're not gonna get the full flat experience though by doing that. So I would be a little bit hesitant, especially riding technical single track, um, about running your SPD shoes on flat pedals. Um, so I know what you're saying, it's, it's something that, you know, if you're a bit flat curious, um, I've been riding flats for the past 12 months actually, um, as a bit of an experiment because I've run SPD pedals for 20 years and now I'm trying flat pedals um, because a lot of people in the UK uh, ride flat pedals a lot more than any other kind of country that I've visited before, um, especially in, the, in Australia, it's SPD heaven here, um, not many people run flats. So it's been quite interesting, but I would highly recommend if you can, um, splash out on some flat specific shoes. There are some really good options out there that aren't super expensive. And if you just find out you don't like flats, um, then a lot of them you can kind of almost wear as casual shoes as well. 510 Districts, I've run those. They're actually a really nice casual shoe, um, but you can ride them on flat pedals. But to give yourself the full experience, good, good shoes, good pedals. Whether you're running SPDs or flats, good shoes, good pedals, are paramount to having a positive experience. And if you use the wrong shoes and you know average pedals, you're gonna have a crap experience and you're gonna go, no, I'm not interested in flats. Um, I'm gonna continue using SPDs. Oh, Matthew's in the house, never clip in on the trail. Well, that's probably a good time to raise this question because a lot of people are death wish. <laughs> you just need to go faster, Matthew. <laughs> yeah, flats versus clips is, can get quite a heated debate, but um, currently I'm running both and kind of switching between the two and it's all, all good fun. Um, from the Quantox, hello, Matthew. Thanks for tuning in. Um, Billy Bot Bash is saying, your best bet will be to replace your pins from a hardware store with longer pins if you want to be safe. Yep, good point there. A lot of the, um, yeah, you're talking about increasing the traction. I still think just go for it. Just do it. Get, get the shoes, get the pedals, just embrace it. You know, give it, you, need, you really need to give it a good amount of time as well. If you've run SPD pedals for a long period like I had, it took me a good two or three months to really kind of develop that technique, redevelop my riding position as well. So you might have to shift your saddle forwards or backwards, drop the saddle up and down. That will likely change. In my experience, I've found I have to run the saddle lower when I'm running flat pedals. And uh, sometimes I'll bring the saddle a little bit further backwards as well. Um, but it, it totally depends on the bike and your riding style and position. But give it some time. If you can splash out for good pedals and good shoes, I cannot recommend it enough. And in my experience, it's not a case of one or the other. Some riders are like that, like Matthew, for example. He's flats for life. Um, but in my experience, I can happily kind of swap between the two and it's, it's absolutely fine. Matthew, flat's giving me so much more confidence knowing I can bin the bike and save my skin. Absolutely, I totally agree with you. If anything, it's the placebo effect, it's the mental effect, isn't it? Going, I know I can get off the bike quickly, I can dismount and throw the bike away. Um, in, in, you know, whereas with clips, you're kind of locked in. Um, that said, if you've run clips for a very long time, your muscle memory gets to a point where I've found anyway, I'll just subconsciously unclip if I'm in a crash. So generally, it's not that big of a deal as people make it out to be, but hey, here we are, and uh, people have personal preferences, and whatever makes you feel more confident is a double thumbs up from me. So, uh, Billy Bot Basher, flats for life. Clips are cheating. <laughs> well, I guess it depends what, uh, what competition we're in, if that's considered cheating. <laughs> right, so uh, yeah, we're just talking about flats and clip pedals. Good point, um, good little segue there. Um, I'm about to finalize a review on some Shimano Saint flat pedals, which have been very, very impressive. Um, not the most grippy pedal, I will perfectly uh, happily admit, but incredibly durable with those cup and cone bearings. So um, stay tuned to singletrackworld.com this weekend. Should have the full review on YouTube as well and the review on the website um, if anyone would like to read about um, our long-term experience with Shimano Saint flat pedals. Um, right, so I don't know if we'll go back to this bag. I might just skip over it, but uh, we're just talking about what I carry in here. I keep it fairly lightweight. I've got a nice, I love this little shock pump. 
Um, before you saw the digital tire gauge, if, um, uh, unless you've just tuned in, welcome. We've got more people tuning in live. Hello, and uh, thanks for joining the live Q&A show. Um, this is like a really shitty version of Dirt Shed. So, um, so welcome, and I hope you enjoy my attempt. Um, but yeah, feel free to ask me any questions as we go along. Um, this is a really compact, you can see it's quite tiny, digital shock pump from Lazine. This is fantastic. I gave this a single track recommended award last year. It might have even been the year before. I've had this for a long time and it's really, really good. Slips into my little fanny bag uh, with plenty of room to spare. So that's good. Uh, Matthew's asking, is there a full review of the new Santa Cruz coming? You're talking about the Mega Tower, aren't you? The, the, the new 29er bike that came out a couple of days ago. That's the 160 mil travel 29er from Santa Cruz. It's basically a 29er Bronson, a uh, 29er Nomad, I should say. Excuse me, Matthew is saying, yes, the Mega Tower, yes. So um, I believe Barney um, did a first ride review on that. I'm not entirely sure if he's gonna be holding onto that bike or it has to go back to Santa Cruz in the UK. Um, but I'll let you know, we'll definitely be keen to get that bike in. If that has that bike does have to go back to Santa Cruz, we'll be getting another one in as soon as possible, because uh, I know Barney was very impressed with it, and, uh, and it's a very hot bike at the moment, big travel 29er. Uh, I just wanted to show you the last thing with this backpack. I've, I've showed you this before, this is a little tool roll, and uh, the Camelback um, Repack has these two really neat waist pockets, so we've got a zippered waist pocket on the side here. I normally keep cash and my uh, keys in here, and then on the side here, we've got another waist pocket, which is just like a little flexible mesh thing. So I can kind of, without having to take this pack off um, while I'm riding, I can actually pull this guy out. And uh, you might have seen the review on singletrackworld.com. This is a little ratchet toolkit, super duper neat. There you go. Give you a bit of a look there. So we've got a little ratchet tool here, all of our little bits in here, Torx bits, uh, hex bits, uh, Phillips head screwdriver. It even comes with a, uh, a torque wrench, or a torque key, I should say. Torque limiter, even, would be a better word for it if I could find the words to talk properly. Uh, five Newton meters, so this is quite useful for stems, handlebars, um, controls on your bike, um, and perhaps even very small pivot bolts as well. So five Newton meters on that one. Oh, seat clamps as well, very useful with dropper posts so you don't over tighten your seat clamp and stop your dropper post from working or damage it. So really nice little tool roll, pop that up. It's got a uh, green elastic strap on there and uh, basically just slides straight into the pocket on the side of the, uh, the pack there, so really neat. Um, so not a huge amount of volume in this, but it's good for those kind of two to three hour rides where I want extra water as well as the bottle on the bike. Um, I can have extra water in this, carry my mobile phone in here, shock pump, uh, tire pump if I want to bring it along, I've got emergency lights, tools, all the rest of it. So there you go. Um, there's one other pack I want to quickly talk about. Um, this is a, another product that got a single track recommended award in 2018. This is from an Australian brand called Henty. Now Henty normally makes sort of commuter style backpacks. This is their first mountain bike specific pack and it's called the Enduro. Of course it's called the Enduro. And it's sort of like not quite a backpack, not quite a fanny pack. Um, it's, kind of a, it's kind of a bum bag with a harness, with a shoulder harness here. And this is all kind of lightweight mesh. It's very thin, this fabric here. Um, very, very lightweight, but I find that when I'm riding with this, most of the weight is handled by the waist buckle and these big supportive kind of, uh, um, oh, I don't know what I would call, wings I would say, that wrap around your waist. So a lot of the weight is already supported on your waist. Um, the harness itself is more just to stabilize the pack. So I was talking before about that bum bag and some bum bags, they do get a little bit bouncy on the back. This doesn't, this stays very, very stable. So it does have a sternum strap across here. A lot lighter than a backpack, a lot more breathable than a backpack. Um, and get this, it'll still store a three liter hydration reservoir. So let me just take out, I've got a shock pump in here. There's another digital shock pump. Um, I'm a bit obsessed with those. Um, this is, let me see if I can get it out. Yeah, I will be able to. This is a three liter Camelback uh, bladder reservoir. It's a, it's a standard vertical Camelback uh, reservoir. Let me unclip this so I can show you the shape of it. It's quite incredible, really. It won't even fit into the, the frame of the video. So this is a three, it's a proper three liter bladder. Now you'd normally have that in a Camelback mule or a hog um, or uh, any of their kind of traditional mountain bike backpacks, three liters. Or well, Matthew saying, looking for any excuse to ditch my old doida. Uh, well, I can highly recommend this pack, um, providing that it has the right volume for it, because it doesn't have a huge amount of storage space. But I, I just want to talk about this because 
Basically what Henty does is they take this three litre vertical bladder and they put it on its side. And this actually wraps around your waist on the back. So uh, the bladder itself, obviously this is nice and flexible, so there's no problems there. Uh, we've got the plastic, of course, the handle at the top there, which isn't so flexible. But when you've got it filled with water, there's still a fair bit of flexibility to it. We've got a quick release hose in here, and uh, this basically tucks in, and uh, let's see if I can get it back in now. That'll be a bit interesting, won't it? And that actually sits in horizontally, so not vertically like you would have in a traditional backpack. And uh, the bladder sits across ways in here. Um, so you can carry three liters of water. I don't think I've ever ridden with such a lightweight bag. Um, this is a fairly lightweight bag, but most importantly, it feels lightweight. I've never ridden with a bag that's as lightweight as this, as breathable as this, that can carry three liters of water. And as you can tell, like when you've got your shoulders up here, this sits right over just above your bum. So very, very low center of gravity on here. Shed life guy, handy if you fall off in a bushfire. Yeah, which happens all the time in Australia. It's really uh, frustrating. Um, but yeah, you've got three liters of water there. You can just uh, squirt, and, squirt and put out the fire. <laughs> oh, Chuck Master's in the house. He's saying hello, or she's saying hello. Hello, Chuck Master. Welcome to the show. Uh, we're just talking about backpacks and this Henty Enduro Pack. Um, now, this was reviewed on the website months and months ago. Um, if you go on singletrackworld.com and search for Henty, you will find my full review. Talk about all of it in detail. But just to show you the, the, the basic construction, we've got a single buckle there which opens up. We've got a spare tube in here. Got me uh, Fix-It Sticks um, toolkit here. You can carry a pump up here. I normally carry a shock pump in here as well. Some nutrition. Um, inside, you can still fit stuff inside here with the bladder. So my wallet, phone, keys, that kind of stuff. You've got two waist pockets on the side here. Um, Chuck Masters asking, asking, do you have testicles? Question mark, question mark, question mark, question mark. Uh, I don't know if I should answer that. Uh, do you mean, do I have testicles or do you have... I, uh, if you're asking a question to yourself, <laughs> um, then might be worth seeing a doctor, I would suggest. I would, in fact, I go see a GP right, right about now. Um, so yes, back to the bag. Um, but please, obscure questions, send them my way. Uh, that's what we're here for. It's live TV. Anything could happen. Um, waist bag, uh, waist pockets here. These are both zippered, one on each side. So uh, very simple. Bike Girl 2 is in the house. Hello, Bike Girl 2. Thanks for the question or comment, nice idea, but I like to carry too much crap with me. Yes, I know exactly what you mean. These are currently my two main backpacks at the moment, and if I wanna carry cameras, um, extra video cameras, recording gear, all that stuff, there's really not enough space in this. So it's, it's more like, how do I carry a lot of water for a decent ride? But when you combine it with, uh, where is it gone? That top tube bag that I was talking about before with your spare tube and all of your emergency spares, um, bottle on the bike, this guy, yeah, for me, I kind of find that for, for an epic ride, um, that kind of covers me. And also, this flappy strap here, so let me try and demonstrate this, but when you've got this, uh, this buckle here, that's adjustable. You can carry a raincoat or knee pads in here quite easily. I've done that many times before, and that works quite well. But yes, if you're going to carry a lot more stuff, you want to carry, you know, your coffee stove and your extra sandwiches and, uh, and all that kind of stuff as well, then you will want a full-size backpack. So uh, yeah, perhaps not ideal for your multi-day kind of um, stage race or, uh, or bike packing ride. Uh, Billy Bob Basher is asking, regarding the bladder, how does it perform when the fluid levels are low? The straw looks to be set halfway up when sat in the bag. Very, very good question. I'm glad you asked that question. Oh, excuse me. So Billy Bob Basher is asking about this Camelback Reservoir and the fact that it sits on its side in this backpack. Here's the trick for you, Billy Bot Basher, is when you fill the reservoir, let me just again unclip this, when you fill up this reservoir, and this goes with any reservoir, no matter how it's positioned in your bag, I can highly, highly recommend this technique. Fill it up, and then before you close the lid, make sure the lid is at, the very, is at a higher level than the rest of the bag, and all of the air rises to the top. And when you do the lid, ensure that there are no air bubbles inside the bladder. Now, if you can do that, you create a, a bit more of a vacuum and the whole bladder stays a lot more stable. So on the back, when you're, you know, if you're riding with this in a, in a standard kind of backpack, you're not gonna get that kind of sloshing about so much when you, uh, ex when you take out all of the air out of the bladder when you fill it up. So I can highly recommend this, whether it's a bum bag, a backpack, or this kind of crazy semi-bum 
bag pack thing, bum pack, I'm gonna call it. Um, make sure you get rid of the air in the bladder. And what that also does is it makes it a lot easier to get the final drops of water. So I've used this for 12, 18 months now and uh, getting the last bit of water, even though this, this bladder sits in the bag like this, even though this guy is sort of halfway up the bladder, it's still possible to get all of the water out of this. So you might get a few drops down the bottom, but that's kind of it really. It's surprising actually how well that suction works. So um, may, maybe I've just got more suction power in my mouth though. Maybe that's, maybe that's the variable there. Um, but yes, if you get rid of all the air bubbles from the bladder before you put it into your bag, um, as I said, regardless of what type of backpack that is, that'll help keep it more stable and it will mean you get all the water out of it as well. So, excellent question. Thank you for asking. Um, Chuck Master, where are you from? Uh, we're filming this in Australia. Bendigo, Australia. Where are you from, Chuck Master? I, I will ask the question to you also. Uh, Bike Girl, also hello. Hello, thanks for tuning in. And uh, Shed Life Guy is asking, can anyone carry a toilet roll <laughs> and a bag? <laughs> Yeah, I think um, when you start going on those like big epic adventure day rides, um, I, I do recall a ride, not, well, it was, it was a couple of years ago, but it was a multi, three day multi day ride. Um, and it was something like, you know, six hours on the bike every day. And you're out in places where there aren't really a lot of facilities. So, yes, toilet paper can be an essential item. I, 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 I'll fully admit I don't carry it with me on every ride. But when the, uh, you know, when the conditions um, suggest otherwise, then it is a very important essential to bring along with you. Uh, Bike Girl, I carry a survival bag and a spare top, etc. cetera. Um, Bike Girl 2, whereabouts are you based? I, I have a sneaking suspicion, I know, but I'd love to know whereabouts you, whereabouts you live and where you, well, not specifically where you live, that's a bit creepy. Um, just roughly, like the country will do. Um, but also uh, where you go riding too, um, because I know a couple of friends back in the UK, um, you know, they take uh, foil blankets, they, you know, your survival kit, you know, how you can start a fire if you get lost in the wilderness, um, all that sort of stuff. So yeah, I'd be interested to know whereabouts you go riding and um, always better to be prepared than not prepared enough, I'm, I'm, I'm sure. Uh, do, 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 do. All right, so we've got a few people tuning in live here. Baby wipes are essential, says Billy Bot Basher. <laughs> yes, baby wipes, they do everything. Not just, you know, to clean yourself up before you go to the pub. Maybe to take the uh, some mud off the chain or, you know, clean up your bike or the, the stanchions on the fork or the shock. Fantastic. And Ollie W is tuning in and saying, wet wipes over bog roll for sure. So <laughs> there you go. Uh, bog roll or wet wipes, which way do you go? You know, which way do you, uh, which do you prefer? I also carry enough stuff, this is Matthew saying, I also carry enough stuff so that if I break my leg, I won't die of cold. These are really important things in the UK. Uh, you've really got to think about if I get stuck in the wild, am I going to freeze to death? That's <laughs> so there you, there you go. If you break your leg and you get uh, where you're mountain biking around the Quantocks, for example, you know, can you stay warm enough so you won't die? Uh, well, here in Australia, it's generally not about how cold it is, is how many snakes are going to bite you while you're lying on the ground. So definitely compression bandage. Um, that's something I should add to my backpack, actually. Now we're talking about it. I think that's a really good idea. Thankfully, I haven't seen any snakes this season, but uh, I really hope I don't. Uh, occasionally, you do come across them on the trail and you kind of have to do an awkward bunny hop to get over them. Um, but yeah, compression bandage for snake bites is, is, is a good essential. Very lightweight, very compact as well. Uh, there's kind of no reason why you shouldn't carry that. So I'm going to do that this afternoon. Dave Kerrigan's in the house. Uh, getting rid of air in hydration bladder. Turn upside down, suck the air out, and then turn the right way up. Yes, excellent technique. Matthew saying, I had to walk 10 miles across Exmoor once. Oh, that sounds horrible. Um, and that's like pea soup up there, isn't it? Suboptimal. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Shed Life Guy. In the UK, it's more like, am I going to get robbed if I crash? <laughs> oh, you make me laugh, Shed Life Guy. That's fantastic. Am I going to get bike jacked while I've crashed? Uh, bike Girl 2. I ride in the lakes and the Peak District. Okay, there we go. I had a sneaking suspicion that's where you're riding. I do a lot of hiking also. So if you come off, you can die overnight if cold. Yeah, out in the Lake District and Peak District, you got some big country out there. I mean, for the UK, as far as the UK is concerned, that's like big open countryside where, 
you know, there might not be services or people for miles and miles and miles. Uh, Bike Girl 2. Oh my God, you're not in the UK, lol. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm in Australia. So I left the UK about five months ago and I've relocated back to Australia in Bendigo. So I was there for about two and a half years. So I'm familiar with riding in the Peak District and the Lake District. Um, and I'm, uh, you know, if I was riding there, I think I did a ride up Helvellyn actually, um, just under a year ago. And it was one of the best all day rides I've ever done. It was absolutely fantastic. We did a feature article for the magazine. Um, but yes, I took a lot of stuff on that ride because, you know, the weather can turn at any point. And although it looks nice and sunny, once you get to the top, you know, we had quite a bit of wind come through. You know, you never know if someone's going to have a fall, whether that's, uh, whether that's, you know, standing and posing for a photo and they fall off a cliff edge or something. Um, so yes, in that, you know, if you're going out for that kind of rides in those kind of conditions and environments, yeah, I, you, you want to be as prepared as possibly as you possibly can. So for me here, a lot of my riding is a lot shorter with, with test rides. You know, I take out a test bike and just thrash it for an hour and a half. Anything beyond that, you start to get a bit tired and it's less useful from a testing perspective. So generally I'm riding fairly lightweight and uh, fairly minimalist with my gear. Um, so yeah, as we said before, I've got this neat little top tube bag. This carries all my essentials. So most mechanicals I can sort out with what I carry in here. And then I can ride, you know, without a backpack um, if I want to and just a bottle on the bike and that's fine. Um, but yeah, a bit different to some of the big days out in the Lake District and the Peak District. So uh, yeah, we've been talking about bags. We've been talking about flat pedals versus SPD pedals. Um, Matthew, isn't heat stroke a problem out there? Um, it could be. You know, the hottest temperature I rode this summer was 42 degrees, um, which is really, really freaking hot. Um, yeah, heat stroke is absolutely a, a big problem. Um, the, the way that I find that I kind of battle heat stroke, well, the obvious ones, drink a lot of water. I mean, that's really straightforward, but drink a lot of water before your ride. Make sure you've got isotonic um, water. So, uh, you, know, you know, you drink powder or whatever, because you're sweating out all those minerals. You need to put them back in, especially if you're going to be on the bike for a couple of hours in 35 degrees plus temperatures. So drink a crap load of water. Matthew saying, um, I melted in 30 degrees here last summer. <laughs> it's all relative though, isn't it? You know, if your normal riding temperatures are 12 to 15 degrees and then it hits 30, that's a big difference. But for here, at the moment, we've got around sort of early 30 degrees, um, which is quite unusual for the end of March. It's quite hot at the moment, given the, the time of year. Um, but relative to 42 degrees, you know, 32 is lovely. That's absolutely fantastic. So it's all relative, you know. Um, but no problems with heat stroke for me. Lots of sunscreen um, all over the face, all over the arms, all over the hands as well, because I've been riding gloveless lately, all over the backs of the hands so you don't get sunburn on your fingers and the, uh, the backs of your hands. Um, so sunscreen, lots of water, um, and just don't go out in the middle of the day, you know, like go out in the morning or the evening when it's a little bit cooler. Um, Bike girl too. Oh my God, 42. I blew a gasket at 32. <laughs> yeah, yeah it, it was really hot. I can't say I was riding particularly quickly that day. And what, what's weird about riding in 42 degrees, um, particularly if you're mountain biking and you're descending, is you don't sweat that much. The, the sweat actually evaporates immediately. Um, so it doesn't feel like you're actually that hot and sweating because you've got a you know breeze over you and your sweat's just evaporating like that. So it's really weird. Um, you have to be very careful because you are sweating a lot. So you've got to put those fluids back into you with your three liters of hydration. So I'd normally carry that bag and drink all of that in a two hour ride. Um, Chuck Masters asking, wait, is your job? Uh, I think we've got some language barriers here, but um, I think you might mean, what is your job? Uh, so um, just in case you haven't watched, I tell you, you haven't watched any of our videos, a quick introduction, my name's Will, and I'm the technical editor for Single Track Mountain Bike Magazine and SingleTrackWorld.com. So I test bikes and I test stuff and I make videos like this and uh, and that's kind of my job. So yeah, just doing like bullshit videos like this and just chatting away in a shed is uh, a lot of what I do. Um, Bike Girl 2, best time to ride is a cold day in November. You know what, I totally agree with you. After being in the UK for a couple of years and, and riding in those kind of like 10, 11 degree days, Absolutely perfect. Um, autumn was my favorite season in the UK. Wonderful riding temperatures. And because we were quite far north, single tracks based up near Manchester in a little town called Tobberden. Um, in summer, you get those kind of like, you know, it does the sun doesn't set till 10.30 at night. Um, Chuck Master is lost in a YouTube rabbit hole. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it can, it can happen to the best of us. Don't worry. Uh, Billy Bop Basher, have you heard of TRW Active and their group sets? 
viable alternative to the big boys, TRW. I have not. Um, do you have a link for this Billy Bop Basher? If you could put that into the comment section, I'd be interested to know what TRW Active is. Um, I know Chips has a Suntour group set on test at the moment. That's the 1x12 Suntour MX or MZ80 group set, I think. So shifter, derailleur, 11 to 50 cassette, um, and 12 speed chain. Um, so that's quite interesting. Micro Shift, another component um, um, drivetrain brand that have full drivetrains available. Um, Rota, the Spanish brand, um, has, well, has announced that it's doing a 1x13 group set. And uh, the guys from Rota have been in touch with us and hopefully we'll have a 1x13 mountain bike group set. The cassette is 10 to 52. Yes. So take that Shimano and SRAM, 13 speed, 10 to 52. Um, as to how it will perform on the trail, I've got no idea. It's hydraulic shifting. So it's a hydraulic trigger shifter and a hydraulic um, big kind of industrial looking Terminator style derailleur. Um, so that's Rota. So there are a few companies out there that are uh, having a real crack at the drivetrain market. Of course, SRAM and Shimano dominate the drivetrain market and brake market as well. Um, so it's good to see other competition from other brands. Bike Girl 2. Yeah, I saw that TRW thing. Looks okay. Mm, all right. I'm going to do some research on this. Thank you very much, guys. I really appreciate this. It's great doing these videos. Um, normally, it's Shed Life Guy kind of throwing out the knowledge, but it's great for everyone else to tune in and, uh, and let me know about new products. It's fantastic. Um, ceramic Speed Pinion Gear System. Total madness. Yeah, we're talking about that um, shaft drive um, thing that Ceramic Speed showed off a prototype at um, Eurobike last year. It was like more roadie focused. Yeah, it was like a time trial kind of style, um, super low friction drivetrain. As to how it will work on the trail, I don't know, but at least you'll be able to mince your carrot in the back of that um, cassette, won't you? While you're riding, you can just buzz it down. You know, that'll be really good to peel your carrots, uh, potatoes. Um, it looks vicious, that thing. <laughs> Um, the Sunray, this is Bike Girl 2, saying the Sunrace thing looks like they could dominate if they can get the price down. Yeah, they kind of went in a bit high. I, you know, this is just my personal opinion. They went in a bit high with that 12-speed drivetrain. I think, because uh, the derailleur was, you know, carbon fiber cage and titanium this and whatever, which is interesting, and it looks, looks interesting for sure. But I think you're absolutely right. If they could bring out a 1x12 system that was, you know, really kind of aggressive on price, heavy, you know, maybe a bit heavier, maybe a bit more basic, but kind of, you know, good shifting. I think there are plenty of people out there who are looking for alternatives to Shimano and SRAM, so there's a real opportunity there, for sure. Um, do, 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 Matthew's saying, we're talking about the um, ceramic speed prototype drivetrain, uh, shaft drive. Torsional loss is probably pretty high regarding ceramic speed along the shaft. Uh, don't know, uh, I'm no engineer, but yeah, it's like a carbon fiber tube, isn't it? It looks like a carbon fiber umbrella tube that they used there, but uh, I don't know how far they're planning to take that prototype, um, or I think it was just a marketing exercise, and holy crap, did they do that well at Eurobike. Everyone was talking about it. the videos went ballistic. I think our video on YouTube has like 200,000 views or something, just showing how it works. It's crazy. Um, Chackmaster's asking inappropriate questions about how much is your YouTube income per month. Um, I can tell you I earn nothing from YouTube. Um, as for single track, we don't earn a whole lot, to be perfectly honest. And uh, with these live videos, we are offering people the option, if they like the live videos, there is the ability to do what we call super chat. And, uh, and that will allow you to actually donate a couple of bucks or whatever, you know, a couple of pounds, whatever you want. Um, to the video and uh, basically to support um, us being able to do these videos. So right now, um, I don't earn anything from them personally. Um, single track doesn't earn really a whole lot. It's not really a viable um, <laughs> income stream to be perfectly honest. But we love doing videos and we love getting to chat to you guys and I really enjoy it. So we're continuing to do it. Um, Billy Bot Basher, can't share any links I'm afraid as YouTube won't allow. Ah, that's a bugger. So we're talking about the comment section there. Just search TRW Active and their website pops up based out in New Mexico, if I remember correctly. Thank you very much, Billy Bob Basher and uh, Ride Girl 2. We're talking about the TRW drivetrain. I'm very interested in checking that out. And on that note, I think, um, you know, while we're talking about YouTube income and uh, questions like that, um, I think we'll wrap this video up. I hope you've enjoyed uh, this edition of Fresh Goods Down Under. I think it's episode nine we're up to now. And uh, wherever you are watching in the world, thank you so much for tuning in. Thanks for being a part of this show. And thanks for asking questions, uh, your, all of your comments as well. I really appreciate it. If you enjoyed the video, please give me a thumbs up. I'd love to see a thumbs up for the video. Um, let me know if there's anything you'd like to see in future videos that we'll be working on in the future. 
Um, I've got a review coming over this weekend of some Saint flat pedals. I'm also working on a fork offset feature. Um, Billy Bob Basher, another good video, thumbs up. Thank you very much, Billy Bob Basher. I'm glad you enjoyed. Um, we've got a big technical feature coming on fork offset um, with lots of information and lots of perspectives from different companies about fork offset, why that is a hot topic at the moment. Matthew, two, th two thumbs up, Will. Thank you, two thumbs up to you, Matthew. Thank you very much for tuning in and, uh, and being a part of the show. It makes these shows a lot of fun to do. Uh, wherever you are in the world, I hope you're having a fantastic time and I hope you've got lots of riding plans for this weekend. I hope the sun sh shines down on you and if not, I hope you have a fantastic weekend filled with food and beers and hanging out with mates. Um, all right, so, ooh, Chack Master's got some more gibberish, so we'll probably wrap it up there, I think. Uh, thanks for tuning in, guys, and we'll see you hopefully next week. Um, I'll let you know if I'm gonna be doing a live video next week, and uh, if not, we'll see you on the